Today, just a quick video about corrosives. Corrosives are one of the most common kind of hazardous materials emergencies. Of the nine hazard classes of chemicals that we go to in hazmat response, the first and most common type are the flammable liquids. And that makes sense given that like half of all hazardous materials shipped on the road are diesel and gasoline. So that makes sense. The next most common kind of emergency are corrosives. So it's important that we have some basic understanding of corrosives. The definition of a corrosive is something that causes full thickness burns to human skin at site of contact within a certain specified amount of time or causes severe corrosion of steel and aluminum. And it's the thing about full thickness burns to the skin that we've got to be uh, conscious of, full thickness destruction of the skin, which, which essentially manifests as burns. So the basic corrosive placard is that diamond shaped white and black placard with a hand on it that's melting as something gets poured on it. And that's a pretty good indicator that you're dealing with a corrosive. If you have a thousand pounds of it or more, certain classes of hazardous materials, you, you need to have placarded at any amount, you know, explosives, for example, radiologicals, for example. But for corrosives, you need a thousand pounds or more to have a placard. So you could be dealing with 900, and 99 pounds of sulfuric acid and if that came down on top of you it would really ruin your day but it's not over that magic number of a thousand pounds so not every corrosive incident is going to be appropriately placarded and you got to remember ultimately it's some minimum wage idiot in some warehouse who's putting placards on trucks and if he forgets and puts the wrong placard on or forgets to put a placard on you could be in trouble anyhow if you see that placard obviously it's corrosive now the most common class of corrosive and what most people think of when they hear corrosive is acid or if they're a little bit more knowledgeable in, in the hazmat world acid and base and so that's true that is the most common type of corrosive by far there's tons of it shipped right there's tons of hydrochloric acid shipped there's tons of sulfuric acid shipped and you, you might notice that i'm saying sulfuric acid hydrochloric acid when you think of other kinds of acid acetosilic acid, uh, butyric acid, acetic acid. There's something else I want to talk about. The ick ending is a hint to you that you're dealing with an acid. So if you only see half of a placard, but you see the word, the first word ending in IC, you might want to watch out for the fact it's an acid. So acids have a pH of zero to seven and bases have a pH of seven to 14. Bases can ruin your day just as easily as acid. Obviously, if you've got a big sulfuric acid tank and that spills on you, that's a bad day. But as you see here, this is some Drano. It's also got that melting hand symbol, meaning that this is a corrosive. So this has got a very high pH. This has got a very high pH. It's got a pH of close to 14. Let me show you. All right, so I put some of that Drano into this cap. Here's the pH strip. This is a base, for sure it's a base. But if we just touch the pH strip to it, nothing happens. There is no color change there. That's because acids and bases need water to become essentially activated. If you had a super pure base here without any water, or even if you had a super pure acid, a very, very, very pure acid with almost no, with no water in it, it would have no pH. It's not until you get water added to it that you get a pH. This incidentally is why things like diesel and gasoline and oils and many hydrocarbon liquids don't have a pH because they don't have any water. If they don't have water, they cannot have a pH. It's not that they've got a pH of seven. They don't have a pH. So we're gonna take some water here and add it to this drain or to this base. It hasn't been dissolving very long. We put the strip in and it turns dark, dark, dark blue, almost black. Meaning that this is a very strong base, which makes sense. So when you got a big hairball or clog of fat down the drain, you add this stuff and it melts the fat. It turns that clogged drain, it turns that fat in the clogged drain into soap. So if I was to pour that in my skin and leave it here, it wouldn't burn, but my skin would get slippery. And then I'd eventually get a hole in my skin. And what it's done is it's taken the fat in the skin and turned it into soap. That's why your skin gets slippery. If you're touching TSP or you're touching Drano, the moisture in your skin interacts, makes a base, starts turning the fat into soap, hence the slippery feel. So you can get a very, very bad burn from bases like sodium hydroxide, 
potassium hydroxide, all those bases. So just because it's a base doesn't mean that it's safe. At the other end of the spectrum, we have acids. And acids have got a pH of less than seven, down to zero for strong acids. So we're gonna take this pH strip, which is still black from the base, and we see it change its color of the Drano, it would start turning redder. So acids obviously can burn. Acids, you get them on the skin, they start burning, you get a burning sensation almost immediately, and you rinse it off. But again, it's important to remember that this isn't the only hazard of acids, and it might not even be the biggest hazard of acids. Certainly, sulfuric acid, pour that in your skin, bad day. Hydrochloric acid, pour that in your skin, bad day. Breathe the vapors, bad day. Picric acid, sounds like an acid. It's not really an acidity hazard at all. It forms little crystals, and those crystals explode under friction. It's an explosive. Uh, hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid. It's not very strong. doesn't have a very low pH. But if I dipped my arm into hydrofluoric acid and then ran over to the shower and hosed off all the acid, I looked at it and go, there's no burns. The skin isn't even red. I'm good. I'm not good. I'm going to be dead in a couple of hours. There's almost nothing that can be done about it because it's going to go... It's going to shut down my heart. It's going to just totally disrupt my nerve impulses. So you end up with something, you know, hydrofluoric acid, which sounds pretty badass, and they use in Delta for glass etching, but its main hazard isn't really acidity. It's not corrosiveness. It's health. So that'll be one of the main points to drive home. So if we're dealing with a corrosive that is an acid or a base, obviously the pH strips are your number one thing you're going to use. There's also a pH meter on the truck, and depending on what you're dealing with, there may be other ways to detect it. But this is going to be your number one way to detect it, to see if it's present or absent, to see if it's getting weaker or stronger. And your removal options to get rid of this stuff are going to include neutralizing it, diluting it if you've got a small spill and a giant amount of water, or absorbing it and then getting rid of it that way. Now let's talk about things that are <laughs> corrosives but aren't acids and bases. And so for that, I'd like you to take a look at Wiser. Wiser's on all the truck tablets. There's also a web Wiser that you can uh, access online. You can download the Wiser app for, for your phone, and it's a really, really powerful tool. So if you go to Wiser, which is this app here, and we're gonna go to the home page, So this is the home page of Wiser in most applications. There's something here called Help Identify. I'm gonna click Help Identify. I'm gonna go Help Identify Chemical. Here you can enter various properties. You can say it's a solid, it's a green gas, it's a purple liquid, it smells like fish, uh, the symptoms include headache, nausea, whatever, and it'll take 500 or so of the most common chemicals and try and narrow it down. It's not doing all chemicals, it's doing a bunch of common chemicals. So if we go to help identify chemical and go down to transport at the bottom, we can select a transport container. We can select a placard. We can select the placard. If we go down to the corrosive placard here, you can see if it's got a corrosive placard on it, it's narrowed down 499 chemicals to 144 chemicals. I'm going to click on that. It's going to let me read off from the top. L-ephedrine, 111 tetrafluoroethane, 11 dimethylhydrazine, 1 butene. I'm skipping now. Acetic acid. So there you go. Acetic acid. That's an acid. <laughs> it ends in IC, acetic acid. It's got the word acid, and that's a pretty strong indicator. Everything else I mentioned didn't end in an IC and didn't have the word acid in it. There's things like ammonia here. So a strong ammonia solution, this isn't the ammonia gas that's in the uh, ice rinks, but a strong ammonia solution would be considered corrosive because it would cause full thickness damage to your skin. There are things here like barium sulfate, calcium oxide, chromic acid, acid, dimethylamine, a whole bunch of things that aren't acids and bases, meaning that that placard eight, the white and black melting hand placard, could be any one of these, and it could be a whole lot more than these. 
Let's consider some of these and see how it affects how we detect it and how it might affect how we deal with it. One of the chemicals was ammonia, aqueous ammonia. Ammonia gas dissolved in water and that is placarded as a corrosive at certain concentrations. So if we had a spill of that, how could we tell how much of it is in the air? So if it's ammonia, ammonia is one of those things that we've got multiple ways of detecting. pH strip is one of them because ammonia, although it doesn't say you know, ammonia base, it is a base. It'll change color. So we take a wetted pH strip and if it changes dark blue, it's a pretty good indicator that there's ammonia gas coming out of solution. We also have an ammonia detector. That'd be another way of getting a continuous measurement of how much ammonia gas is in the air and how much of a hazard there is. So in that case, we don't only have the pH thing, we've also got the ammonia detector and there's some ammonia pole tubes as well and some ammonia strips. There are lots of ways to detect ammonia and in any given situation, we might use one or more of those to detect the amount of basic gas that's in the air. Another chemical in the list of wiser corrosive compounds is formaldehyde. So you might be thinking, if it's corrosive, can I use a pH strip? The answer is yes, you can. Formaldehyde has a pH, if you look it up, it's low. Uh, it's, it doesn't have the word ick at the end of it. It doesn't have the word acid at the end of it, but it still has a pH. So proving that you have to do research on the specific compound. So you could use a pH strip. If you looked into it a bit deeper, you'd find out that formaldehyde is an organic chemical. You might be thinking organic chemical. Don't we have something that can detect organic chemicals? We do. The PID, the photoionization detector. This has got a lamp in it with 10.6 electron volts of energy. It can ionize, it can give a charge to chemicals that have got an ionization potential of 10.6 electron volts or less. So we've got the pH strips, but maybe we're running out of pH strips or maybe we want a more nuanced thing that can detect a little part per million in the atmosphere. We're gonna go into formaldehyde. We're gonna go into properties. We're gonna go into ionization potential. And we're gonna find out to our chagrin that formaldehyde has got an ionization potential of 10.88 electron volts. 10.88 is higher than 10.6. We're skunked. We could be sitting in an ocean of formaldehyde and the pit here would not be picking up any organic vapors. Even though it's producing gases, even though they're organic, this is an example of where the PID isn't going to work. Let's take a look at one more that's on this list, cyclohexanol. So we're going to look into cyclohexanol and we're going to find out it doesn't have a pH listed. We might do some more research and we just cannot find a pH. Usually it's not going to say this chemical doesn't have a pH. If only life were that simple but you won't find a pH listed. For various chemical reasons, cyclohexanol isn't going to give you a pH. You're just not gonna find one in the literature. That's because it doesn't have a pH. It's an organic chemical. It doesn't have a water. It's not dissolved in water. And even if you were to add water, it wouldn't split the water enough to give you readings of you know, hydronium ions or hydroxyl ions, which is a whole nother talk. Short, long story short, <laughs> pH paper won't work. All right, so what do we have that can detect cyclohexanol? Well, if you've ever sat through an intro, you know, the, one of the bootcamp modules, you might be thinking cyclohexanol, hex. And you think meth, eth, prop, but, pent, hex. Hexane is a six carbon molecule. Hexanol is a six carbon molecule with an OH at the end of it. It's an alcohol group. Cyclohexanol means you put it into a circle. That doesn't really matter. What matters is, does cyclohexanol have an ionization potential of less than 10.6? So you're gonna look it up. You're gonna look up cyclohexanol in Weiser's. I'm gonna scroll to cyclohexanol. Here we go. I'm gonna go into properties. I'm gonna go into ionization potential, 9.75. So yes, the pin would be able to see cyclohexanol. It, it might not have the correction factor for it, but it'll still be a hotter, colder detector. If I'm getting 100 parts per million of cyclohexanol here and 500 parts per million of cyclohexanol there, I can be pretty sure that the source of the leak is over there. It might not actually be 100 parts per million. It might actually be 500 parts per million. That depends on the correction factor, but it's still a hotter, colder detector. And if you're getting 5,000 parts or 2,000 parts per million of cyclohexanol, there's a lot of cyclohexanol in the air. The other thing that might work is if you can get your hands on an alcohol pull tube, cyclohexanol is an alcohol. 
if you think of the common type of alcohol that's in beer, wine, uh, any kind of liquor, is ethanol. If you think of like rubbing alcohol, isopropanol. Methanol, the stuff that makes you go blind. Methanol. Alcohol. Alcohol. O-L. That O-L ending is a hint that you're dealing with an alcohol, which means you're dealing with an organic chemical. And as you get more comfortable with hazmat, you're going to start recognizing the endings of words. You're going to start recognizing that words that end in all, O-L, tend to be alcohols. You're going to start recognizing that words that end in ick are often acids. You're going to start recognizing that words that end in own, O-N-E, tend to be ketones. So that's as you start getting deeper into it. Don't get too bound up there. Just know that if you if you look it up and it's got an ionization potential of less than 10.6, you might be able to use your PID. There are three big take home lessons that I want you to come out of this with. Number one, most corrosives are acids and bases, but not all corrosives are acids and bases. There are corrosives that have nothing to do with acids and bases that can still destroy your skin, give you a full thickness destruction of your skin. Those might include alcohols, those might include aldehydes, those might include uh, peroxides. There's all kinds of chemicals that can destroy your skin all the way down. So if you're dealing with a corrosive placard, you should be thinking pH strip, but maybe a pH strip isn't going to be enough, right? Maybe a pH strip won't even pick it up. You've got to do your research. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two is that just because something's an acid or a base doesn't mean that that's the only hazard. You can have something that's an acid or a base and a corrosive, that's also a poison. You know, something that's an acid or base, that's a corrosive, that's also explosive. You know, something that's an acid or base, that in theory is also radioactive, right? You, you, you cannot, you could combine these different hazard classes together. It really depends on the chemical. That's the second thing I want you to take home with. And the third thing for the hazmat nerds is start looking at the words themselves. Here's the two things I'd like you to concentrate on there. Number one, if you see the word meth or eth, or prop, or but, or pent, or hex, or hept, or oct, or known, or dec, inside a word. You've got one, one, dimethyl, decane. That looks very complicated. All you need to recognize is dec. Go, you know, I wonder if this is an organic chemical. There are a few exceptions, but most of the time, if you see the word meth, or eth, or prop, or but, or hex, like we talked about it, or oct, or one of those 10 words, it's gonna be organic. Not always, but most of the time. And then for super nerd points, start looking at the ends of words. If you see IC, think acid. Not for sure, but quite likely. If you see OL at the end of a word, think alcohol. Not for sure, but quite likely. If you see ONE at the end of a word, think ketone. Not for sure, quite likely. You know, there, there are meanings to the ends of words. If something ends in AL, if something ends in uh, peroxide, those mean things, and they're, they're, they're ways of identifying chemical categories. All right, thanks for listening.